Hello, hello. Check, check, sound check. How's it sound? Out there in Twitch land. Hello. Welcome to the Momo Show, our return episode. Thank you, Gonzo. Appreciate it as always. Why don't you say hello? Hey, hey. All right. Yeah. So uh, hopefully it's not too loud. Hopefully the audio is okay. Um, I do have some tunes playing too. I'm not sure if the music is uh, audible. Uh, oh, it stopped. Let's go ahead and just. Oh, it looks like it's really quiet. There we go. Can you hear the music at all? Uh Okay, all right. I'm not gonna stress about it too much. Um, anyways, welcome to the Momo Show again. Uh, good day to you, and thank you for joining. Um, we're back after a little bit of a break. Um, uh, my intention is to resume a weekly stream pattern. Um, if you're a uh, you know, long time listener, watcher of the stream, I was doing it twice a week, but uh, we're gonna take it down to once a week this time, and yeah, and a little bit later too. Uh, so some of my West Coast friends can join us. Um. But yeah, lots of cool stuff unraveled since the last time we met. So just jumping right in, and in no specific order, we'll go ahead and quickly go through the list of neat stuff we have for you. Um, the ModdingOpenMW.com team is working on the next update for the website. Of course, is 6.10.0. We're calling it the UMO update, featuring an automatic installation guide. Hey, Detail Devil. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you for joining, man. Uh... Yeah, just uh, jumping right in, though. So up here, I've got the beta version of the website up. Um, we're hard at work on it. It's like in the oven, just about ready, and we'll get to uh, what what it needs to be, what needs to be done for it to be ready. But uh, we have this new snazzy, um, you know, intro page. When you just come to moddingopenmw.com, you'll be greeted with two buttons here automatic install and manual install and we're just going to jump right into the automatic install link which takes you to our automatic installation guide and basically what we have done is thanks to uh the work of an enterprising amazing individual that we all know and love as fall children we now have tooling that can basically take the you know 500 plus steps uh, really, it's like a thousand steps because every mod has at least one or two, has at least two steps, I feel like. Download it, extract it, and then, you know, whatever else. So effectively, for total overall, we've taken a thousand steps and condensed it down to really like a handful. Um, yeah, literal game changer for sure. Um, and so, yeah, uh, to, to sort of aid y'all in um, getting through this new process... Um, we have the automatic installation guide. Gonzo, by the way, am I slideshow mode, Detail Devil? Am I slideshow right now, or am I looking good? All right. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I'm just going to quickly go through the automatic installation guide. Um, we got a handy-dandy quick start. By the way, this guide, mostly written by Gonzo, so uh, many thanks and props. Um, the rest of the team has contributed here and there, but it mostly is the brainchild of you, my man. So thank you for your work. Um, and, yeah. If you have, uh, thank you so much, Detail Devil. If you have used our website in the past, you might be familiar with our user guide that we had, which which did its best to try and guide you through, you know, um, the myriad of things you got to do to to end up with a functional, correct setup. But uh, we got a quick start up here that is just a very high level view, and then yeah, um, we cover you know getting actually OpenMW on your computer whether it's a dev build or a stable uh release we have a form here for you to pick a mod list i'm gonna go with just good morrowind here it's a click the radio button there and then click submit and the page will actually reload you'll notice that the url is actually different now we have the mod list appended to the url so the page knows what list you're using and will update the steps accordingly um and then yeah down here we have a, a fabulous video produced by the one and only gonzo um which i believe is going to be seeing an update because Umo has changed since this video was made. The, the configurator was born, which we'll get to that in a moment. Um, Umo, previously named Umamda or o UMD or <laughs> however, I don't think we ever settled on an official pronunciation for it. We just jumped into Umo, which flows and feels so much more nice. Um, 
But yeah, so this is a real quick guide on Windows, how to download Umo and get rolling with it. And then we have another guide here with a video created by our community friend, Sulphur, Cache OS user, props, uh, on how to use it on Linux with some written steps for you as well. And then also for our friends that use Mac OS, um, War, my man. Hey, <laughs> it's great to see you, dude. Thanks for popping in. I was hoping you'd pop in. Um, man, this is interest of interest to you, dude, because uh, War is an old real-life friend of mine. We've known each other for like 20 years. We're old farts. Um, War never really gotten into OpenMW. You know, it's a lot of work to get set up with Total Overhaul. Actually, what I'm covering right now, my man, is uh, <laughs> is an automatic installation guide. And we talked about this a little bit before, but we have a much more well uh ironed process for doing this so i'll have to like send you the details but in a nutshell yeah we got this auto install guide we got a tool to automatically download and extract and and massage the files it's for a guy like you my man absolutely sten whoa hey welcome pika geez all my real life friends are coming out of the woodwork this is great um, so anyway, back to the UMO section here, though. We got a guide for Linux, Windows, Mac, all the big three OSs that are officially supported by OpenMW, which feels really great. Props again to Fall Children for kind of getting this out the door. <clears throat> but after you have used the UMO magic to automatically download and extract and massage the files as needed, uh, we have something called the Momo Configurator, which by the way, since the last time we've met, we've actually settled on a pronunciation for M-O-M-W that kind of flows a little bit more, and we're the Momo team. M-O-M-W, Momo, that's how it be. So we got the Momo Configurator, which is yet another command line tool. So we have taken a thousand plus steps and boiled it down to a handful or so centering around two command line utilities. <laughs> hey, Krabby Mudcrab, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, glad you're here today with us. And yeah, uh, that's a funny image. I feel like we needed GIF of that. Um, so, but what, as written here, the Momo Configurator tool, basically it wraps the process. Uh, again, if you've used our website, we've got the config generator page, which had some snippets that you could copy paste into your own files. But it's like, you know, despite preparing the 100% perfect config for you, it's somewhat easy to potentially get wrong, right? And it doesn't, actually, I lied when I said 100% because the config generator page doesn't give you the the data that we import from the vanilla Morrowind INI file. So the configurator actually does that. The configurator imports a fresh CFG from Morrowind.ini. It downloads the data from our website, slaps it into your file for you, and it makes sure that appropriate settings are set in settings.cfg. Um, and so it's a quick rundown of how to use it on the big three OSs again. Um, and the really nice thing, I think, about the configurator tool is that it also runs supporting tooling like Delta Plugin, uh, Ground Coverify, Waza Light Fixes. And that's important because when you run these things, there's some things you got to be careful about, right? Like you want to disable the plugin for light fixes before you run light fixes and so forth. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Krabby Mud Crab. That's a very important distinction. I wouldn't lie. I was just goofing, just goofing. So yeah, after you've used the magical tooling to set everything in place for you, you're almost ready to go. We recommend that you check out our, um, tweak settings page, our performance guide page. Cause one thing the configurator doesn't do is it doesn't set things like your viewing distance um, because that's like subjective. Every computer can handle a different value for that, you know. So uh, we do encourage you to, to change gameplay settings, run the game before you really get settled in for a two, three hundred, four hundred hour run of Morrowind total overhaul. Get the settings right so you have a good performance and you can really enjoy the game. Um, and then we have also put together a mod list FAQ page where over the years we've had, you know, questions that come up a lot. Understandable questions. Where's that puzzle box? Uh, and other things. So we go through that here and, uh, you know, we encourage readers to take a look at that. And uh, boom, at that point, now you're finally ready to play the game. So um, we're just ecstatic to bring you this update. And, you know, we have we still have all the information that you may know and love for the manual install. Um, sometimes maybe if you're just doing iHeart Vanilla, a smaller mod list, maybe it makes sense 
just to do a manual install, you know? And also, one thing, like, obviously it sounds pretty grueling to install 500 mods manually, but something like the FAQ page is a little bit perhaps less necessary uh, when you do a manual install because you are actually looking at everything that you have and you might maybe have less questions about what the hell is going on here, you know? Um, but yeah, so we still have all this information here, accurate, maintained, up to date. We got the folder deploy script and everything for you. For those folks that just want to do it manual, um, we had somebody hop into Discord who was doing iHeart Vanilla and you know, using command line stuff was a little bit, you know, much for them. So they just chose to go manual and it worked out well for them. Uh, so, yeah, that's the big update we've got cooking. Um, really, there's two things that we're waiting on before we put a bow on this. And it's number one, we uh, have had some reports of people using Microsoft Windows getting uh, flag, uh, the configurator getting flagged by Microsoft Defender, saying that it's malware, that it's virus, Um that's obviously no good, so Microsoft ha kindly has a, uh, a form that you can submit the executable and they'll scan it. And I'm really happy to uh, confirm that so far we're like maybe 60% done getting scanned by Microsoft, but it's not malware. So, yeah, 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 um, I agree, Detail Devil. I actually was surprised I didn't think anybody would want to use manual given the choice to do it automatically, but then like that same day... Somebody showed up who was like, hey, you know, I'm going to do it manual. So, hey, respect. Um, so, yeah, just getting uh, Microsoft to confirm the configurator is not a virus. You know, I don't – I solemnly swear it's not, but obviously you shouldn't trust a stranger on the Internet. You know, you shouldn't run random binaries and all that kind of thing. Um, it's good to be vetted. So, um, And then on a similar note, we have actually submitted UMO. Let's uh, – while we're here, I'll go ahead and open up the website for UMO so you all can see it. Um, we have submitted UMO to Nexus Mods for approval as a f an official modding tool. And uh, I'll be updating the website to remove this later today. But yeah, this really slick uh, logo that was created primarily by Gonzo, but with the input of the rest of the fabulous Momo team. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Nexus Mods is pending review of UMO to be an official modding tool and what that means is right now when you use umo you have to go into nexus you have to use what's called a personal api key um and 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 plop it in there and that's not something they really kind of endorse for wide adoption you know and so we're trying to get approved by them and then it'll be a little bit more of a, a different process than what we have now <clears throat> that's a crabby mud crab that's an excellent question i don't really know um I can only guess at a high level, uh, the configurator makes two HTTP calls um, to the modding OpenMW website. And obviously, you know, a, a malicious piece of software might like scan your computer for passwords or whatever, and then like send it off to a server on a, on a bad guy's data center or whatever. And so like maybe they scanned the configurator and they saw, oh, it's making web calls, you know, and or, or maybe like Gonzo said, yeah, maybe it's just like a you're guilty until proven innocent system, which, hey, you know. Fair enough. It's a it's a good thing for the users of Windows to protect them from things that might be bad. So, and I'm happy to go through their process. And again, they have mostly said it's not malware, so I'm I'm confident that we're going to get there soon. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we went ahead and covered that. So I'm gonna we'll probably jump into this next, but I'm gonna go through the rest of the list real quick. And uh, last time on the stream, we uh, let's see here. We went over my distant fixes. Lua edition mod, which if you're not familiar, there is a phenomenon in uh, the Morrowind kind of game mechanics where some quests will, uh, let's make, let's bigify this. Um, some quests will maybe add or remove buildings uh, as part of the gameplay. So like the, uh, the, the big three great house quests, for example, will, spoiler alert, allow you to build a base and that's what you're seeing right here on the screen here is the house Tilvani base basically the way it works is the scripts in the game will when you start a new game they will disable the buildings so that they disappear however the way OpenMW works and I think actually the original exe has the same issue they have uh, the mge folks have developed a different workaround for this um, but basically when you approach the cell you can see not like this come on like this, when you approach the cell, you can see the building and then, boo, gross, it pops out. Um, and so my mod intends to basically address this 
with a programmatic solution so that when you load the game, we disable things ought to be disabled, we enable things ought to be enabled, and we also listen for quest updates to make sure that things happen um, not like that in the pop-out, pop-in way. But uh, an interesting thing is, while I was testing it with uh, Total Overhaul for the first time recently, I noticed that there was a, a spicy bug, and it basically crashed on load up because of what I've determined to be a race condition. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on. But hey, this term again, race condition bug. Uh, <clears throat> bound balance, which is, uh, let's go ahead and balance, is another mod that I wrote, which uh, aims to basically uncheese. The, if you ever played Morrowind, whoa, GitLab, you can do it. Come on, buddy. My CPU is going crazy. Am I slide showing right now? Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's, um, I bet it's all these tabs I got open. I'm going to go ahead and close them. A little bit, okay. Um, anyway, this is my, oh, oh no, bro. Um, we are in slideshow mode. Ugh, yeah, I can, can see, um, OBS is really chugging my CPU right now, and I'm not sure what's going on. Um, and yeah, it's very unfortunate Gonzo's not showing up in the stream here. Let me just do a little bit of, say something real quick, Gonzo. Uh, thank you, Detail Devil. Can you guys hear Gonzo at the moment? Say hi, Gonzo. Well, I hope, I hope Gonzo, I like clicked some buttons. No, no, Gonzo. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to work that out um, beforehand next. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got Gonzo here with me. Yeah, oh, that's a bummer. I'm really sorry, y'all. Um, back to the topic at hand, though. Um, Gonzo can be with us in, in text spirit form. Um, but I've got this mod, Bond Balance, which de-cheeses the uh, vanilla bound weapons. And... Uh, how it does that is basically it scales their power and weight with your conjuration ability uh, skill. So uh, when you start the game, you can't in the first 20 minutes, you know, get the bound axe spell and you got like one of the best weapons in the game. It's going to be basically useless until you have a good skill. However, one of the features I built into it is it will notice what you had equipped before you summon a bound weapon and then try to re-equip it when the bound weapon despawns. And... Uh, one of the things I noticed is I basically am using the on update engine handler, which runs every frame. And uh, eh, that's a bit of a bad practice, to be honest with you. If you are a prospective Lua mod developer, you really want to, especially in 0 0.49, you really want to avoid using on update if at all possible. Sometimes it makes sense. But for what I'm doing here, it just it, it I hit another race condition, and we'll get into the details of that in a little bit. Um, another thing I wanted to do was basically develop a work in progress lists feature for the website, whereby we can develop large mod list updates alongside stable list updates. And what I mean by that is, in the past, we had a different branch for like when we were getting ready to launch 6.0. Everybody, uh, long time users of the website might remember last year we were hyping it up big time. Big update, lots of changes, um, but like it was a bit of a nightmare to merge that in because we had the stable branch going this way, we had the development branch going this way, um, and so my intention is that we'll have a different category of lists that basically don't show up on various website information bits, such as the all mod list page, what list the mod is used in, and then there's probably other things I'm not thinking of, so if we get to hacking on this today, um, we'll, we'll implement that. And then uh, something I thought maybe we might get to is... Uh, the Momo configurator tool, actually, if it has a problem, it will tell you, hey, rerun it, but use the dash dash verbose flag, which will uh, give you the output of things, which we hide by default because it's really noisy. However, when you're using dash dash verbose, it still tells you to do that, which is a little bit wonky. So I don't know, maybe we can, should be a real small, easy change, but uh, excuse me, maybe we could fix that. Yeah, exactly, detail level. Time run repeatedly, repeatedly is basically what you want. Nine out of ten times when you're using on update, that's what you really want. Um, and it's obviously like, you know, a lot. It plays a lot more nicely performance-wise and uh, potentially with uh, potential race conditions. And then another thing, uh, community member. Uh, uh oh, I think I'm dropping into slideshow mode here, potentially. Um, community member, though, uh, 
Jason Morley has re- released uh, OpenMW Hit or Miss Indicators, and I thought I might fire that up and so we could take a look at it. Um, Mamma mia, what's going on with my computer? <sighs> okay, thank you, Smallio. That's good. Might be a slight delay. Yeah, okay, looks like it's calmed down a little bit. Whew, thank you, Smallio. I'm glad you're here. Um, so actually, you know what? I think I want to do this first, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll give this a spin here. Let's give this a try. Uh, the video that they had on the thread on Discord looked pretty cool. So um, let's just take a close up look at it, shall we? Let me go here. My mods, user interface. Ooh. We don't even really have to ever do this anymore. So it's like almost feels a little strange. Hit or miss indicators. Let's add the script. And then let's, uh. Hey, Detail Devil, thank you. Great question. And thank you for banging that out. I didn't get a chance to look at it yet, but it's on my to do list for today. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you again. And I really appreciate the collaboration on that. Great mod. And, uh, you know. We'll get that patch verified so people can have the best possible experience with it. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's run it, huh? Let's see some hit or miss indicators. Ooh, all right. Okay. Oh, you know what? Hold up. Give me that script. There you go. I'm like, where's my sword? There we go. All right. Ooh. A little bit too much there. Come on. I need to really get a proper streaming PC one of these days, but for now we're going to go into Let's let's back out of here and potatoify my settings a little bit more. Let's just do a really really short view distance here cuz uh woof. <laughs> Yeah. All right, cool, cool. Here we go. This is a bit more manageable. Soon, by the way, I really hope to take a look at some of the new TR content that's coming up. But uh, all right, so we got the hit or miss indicators. Let's see, we've got some options here. All right, zero configuration. Got no problem with that. Oh, man, I really hate to do this, but actually not. Let's go pick on our friend Fargoth. Hey, buddy. Whoa. <laughs> it was cool. Very subtle. No. I'm not going to jail. Get out of here. Wow, I see that. Minus three, minus 260. Wow, that's pretty cool. Sheesh. Wow. Really cool. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> How are you even talking to me from here? Let's do something I got a little less skill with. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Uh, the effect of it kind of like floating up, like that's some user interface wizardry that I really respect. Wow, that's pretty cool. All right, well, yeah, props. Yeah, the floating numbers are awesome. Mad props, that's like excellent. Um, very nice UI design and, and yeah, wow, okay. Let's go back to our set list here. We're going to check that off. Um, and so let's take a look at this race condition bug. And so um, what do I mean by a race condition? I mean like when you have two different points of code um, that each intend to do something maybe differently, but they kind of have some overlap. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it was very subtle. You're going to have to download the mod and fire it up and see for yourself. Highly recommend doing that. Um, wow, did I actually get the race condition here too? That was very unexpected. Hang on. Uh, but you have basically two code points. Yeah, wow, it even happened here too. Wow, okay. Maybe a lot of mods isn't required. Maybe it's just a, an engine change that happened. But basically, we have... Let's just jump right in to the code. So we have two bits of code that are basically trying to get to the same point, and one is getting there too soon. And what I mean by that is we have in the player script, taking a step back even further, we ha when you load the game, we have a little chunk of code that reads the data of what to disable, and then it sends that data to the player right here, and then that way, when a quest update happens, we can go through the data that we have and we can say, ah, okay, I've got to disable this, I've got to enable that. But what's happening here is it's saying on quest update failed. Bad argument, expected table got nil. And what's happening is this is happening before this, even though I wrote it explicitly for this to happen first. And it definitely used to be that way. Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking, one approach uh, is, uh, hey, we can bust out the function actually that Detailed Devil mentioned just a moment ago. Time run repeatedly. So what I'm thinking is we'll do either right here or in may perhaps the script body, we'll have run repeatedly, run repeatedly, maybe once every three seconds or so. And we'll have like, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, we'll have like a Boolean variable here, local ready false okay and then we'll have uh let's go ahead and actually get uh local time required open mw aux time and uh yeah right here in the script body we'll say time run repeatedly thank you my autocomplete and run repeatedly will basically check that quest data is not nil and uh, there's a specific way we'll do that. We'll get there in a moment. But what, what that will do is we'll say, um, yeah, 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 right. So um, we need to we need to loop here. Uh, we'll just say like, um, hmm, okay. Uh, we'll say while not ready. Okay, and uh, so hey, Sadiness, thanks for hopping in. Um, and yeah, I don't know. There's something I want to say. Maybe my uh, CPU governor settings are not correct. Um, I have attempted to set my CPU to performance mode. Give me all the juice. Um, and I and it's if we can just see it right here, CPU freak info. I'm, it's still allowing it to go. Uh, see, yeah, we can see the frequency. Is it 2.7 gigahertz? No, 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 no. It should be maxed out. Um, thermal throttling, maybe. Yeah, my fan is going. It's a little hot. Um, hmm. That's actually a reasonable theory. Anyway, I hope it's not too insufferable for you all on the stream here. Um, we'll continue on here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say... Uh, ready stick it in the fridge yeah well so i have like my ceiling fans on sophia hey welcome glad you're here thanks for popping in um i've got my ceiling fans running in a kind of a hope and uh you know it's kind of colder up here in illinois right now uh, with the hope that it would sort of thermalize my cpu but obviously not quite doing it um okay um this is probably not the final form, but let's go ahead and just implement this now, and I can probably smooth it out later. But the intention is, while we're not ready, we're going to say go to not ready. Okay, and so um, what this bit of code does is it says, it does what it says, really. While not ready, go to not ready, and not ready is back up here. And so this is, you know, it's a little risky because we could end up doing it, like, really fast. Um, I'm actually going to print And okay, let's go back to let me go to the documentation. 
And uh, yeah, believe it or not, I actually don't have how all the code works locked into my brain. So we're just going to go ahead and take a look at the friendly documentation to run repeatedly. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, so when you run the run repeatedly function, it returns a function that you run to stop the timer. And so um, what I'll do is, uh, hey, Atuelpo, welcome. I'm so glad you popped in. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, so what we'll do is it'll run repeatedly. And then when we're done running it, we'll call stop me. Stop me. Somebody stop me. There we go. So when we get here, when the while loop breaks out of there, we'll hit stop me and then we'll stop the timer. Okay. So run repeatedly. What are we doing here? So the arguments for run repeatedly is uh, the function to run repeatedly, period being the time period interval. Um, yeah, detail double. I agree. It's super handy. And what detail double is talking about is when I'm writing, uh, you know, when I'm writing a mod, let's go ahead and back out of here. When I'm writing a mod, I need not close open mw and rerun it i can actually open the console type reload lua hit enter and it will reprocess my code and the vast majority of contexts that's enough to see your changes in your code live in the game it's super handy uh, i believe shaders also have an auto reload feature which is pretty cool um mesh updates mw script updates would be amazing i'm not really sure how attainable either of those are i assume it's got to be doable but i'm not sure how much tottery will be need todd howardery would be required for that so all right let's go ahead and function and comma we'll fill in the guts of the function here momentarily and uh okay so number the second argument here will be a number for the interval and i'm gonna do uh, three seconds and uh so let's say if and so uh in lua I think probably the most or one of the most reasonable ways to tell if a table is empty, which by the way, this doodad here that we're, that we're waiting to be filled with data, this is a table. And one of the best ways, if not maybe the best way to tell if a table is empty is to use the next built-in function. So you will do next quest if next quest data equals nil. If, uh, well, let's say, uh, Oh, time second. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is good. I missed that. So let's do time second. Good call out detail, Devar. I appreciate that. Pair programming. Here we go. All right. Uh, let's say if it's not nil, we're going to say ready, true. Okay, so let's run through this real quick. This is going to run every three seconds. Ooh, okay. Um, great question, Krabby Mud Crab. So we're talking tabbing underneath a line of code. Uh, well, so the in so it, taking a step back in Lua, indenting is actually just totally optional. I can actually like do this, and that's totally fine. But uh, my editor, when I hit tab, it will space things out so it's more readable. But um, it's it's mostly pr the code is mostly procedural. So the stuff after it. Oh, I think I'm in slideshow mode again. Woo. I might need to like do some surgery on my laptop to make sure it's got a proper proper uh, thermal paste or something. I don't know. Oh, wow, bummer. Um Oh, am I really dark too? Okay. Yeah, the sun was like in the window. It's not so much now. Let me try to fix that. <laughs> Hey, Joe Toho, welcome. Great question. Um, it is like an iterator. Uh, yeah, so basically it, uh, I'm not sure if it works like if you're familiar with Python, there's like generator functions and it will spit out the next one each time. I assume it kind of is. I've really only used next to just check if a table is empty. That's a really great question. Um, it would be neat to do an experiment on that sometime. Um, but let's run through this real quick. So what we have here is when the mod loads, this code's going to lo load up and start running. We're going to have our timer every three seconds. Um, another argument 
the third argument is a table of options um you know i think the defaults for these are pretty good so we're not going to use any um but yeah so this is going to load up the global script's going to do its thing read the data and try to send it to the player script this is going to run on quest update so what i have in my um in my uh config here let's go back I have this little bit right here. Let's zoom it in so you can see. And th what this does is when I load the game, it's going to run this testing.mw script file. And it's a bunch of MW script code, as you might have guessed. I'd use it for uh, excuse me, testing and prototyping. And one of the things I have in there, let's just load it up, testing.mw script. And uh, one of the things I do is I automatically begin, excuse me, whew banana burps one of the things i do is i automatically begin the quest to go to balmora uh i had that in there just for uh, purposes of testing other mods that i have developed and so um this quest update is triggering before again like i mentioned whoops it's triggering before we actually have any data here so in theory when i start the game which i will do in a moment in theory we're going to see oh no's printed a couple of times hopefully not too many and then the data will load and there will be no crash. Um, I'm sure it's going to work perfectly on the first try. So let's just do it. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Oh, yeah. See, look at it. It's just totally spammy. Yeah, it's not going to work. Not going to work. Okay. Close it. Close it. Close it. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I created an inf infinite loop. Um, I should also mention. Oh my! Come on now, you can do this. We might have to manually intervene here. Oh my! Something's really borked. Pdrep. Open MW. Kill it. All right. Boom. There we go. Whew. So this is no good. We don't want to just, uh, <laughs> we don't want to just, you know, very quickly. We need like a break here. Like, uh, oh no, wait a minute, then go to not ready. Um, so let's, uh, let's see what our options are here. Let's go back to the friendly documentation. And, uh, okay. Yeah. You know what, what we're going to do is we'll, we will here in the while loop, we will set off a timer uh, hmm. We might be just headed for race condition city here. <laughs> so taking a step back, this situation that creates the race condition is not actually like a realistic scenario. Um, it's only happening because of my test script. And this kind of dive into what's a race condition and how to resolve it is probably strictly academic. But we're still gonna let's you know chug ahead on this for a little bit longer. Um. I don't want to end up in like a, a stack of like yes, no switches, right? So I've got this, by yes, no switch, I mean like this ready Boolean here, right? Um, let's think about this for a moment. While not ready, we can set a timer, but unfortunately this is just gonna set off a bunch of timers. Um, so not ready and let's, let's uh, local timer done, false. race the first one race so it's a race because two points of code are trying to do something that should happen in an expected order but it actually happens not in the expected order it's not idempotent um all right so while not ready if timer done Yeah, okay, that's a that's a really great question. Actually, maybe that's part of the problem. Um, good call out, Jotoho. Actually, maybe this is not necessary. Let's comment that out for a moment here. And if timer done, we're going to say a time. We do want a game timer. Right, I'm having trouble remembering if 
simulation timer covers when the game is paused. Uh, let's just look at some of my other code here. Yeah, simulation timer is what I want. Okie dokie. And much like the uh, run repeatedly a function, simulation timer uh, takes a couple arguments, including the delay. It's a little bit different uh, form from the repeated run repeatedly function where we have to actually give it a callback function. So let's uh, let's do that. Um, local timer. We're going to do a register timer callback. And we have to register this in the script body for some implementation reasons here, but uh, we can't just do a function in line here because bad things could happen if we like manage to save the game and then reload it uh, before it gets stopped. Um, all right, so let's... Uh, Done. Funk and FN are suspiciously similar here. Oh yeah, um Krabby Mud Crab, that's interesting. Yeah, you can totally do that right now by simply setting the time scale variable, I think, to one, which would make it one to one with real lifetime. Um I've known some folks who've done that, like made the time scale much more realistic i personally prefer to have a longer time scale uh i feel like the day night cycle in default morrowind and indeed other bethesda games is a bit too quick for my liking personally yeah yeah so that's trivially done with mw script no lua required um interestingly not documented here is this fn callback let's just take a look at my go home code here callback hmm, okay yeah i'm not even i'm not even using it here I use my code to other code to sanity check my other code. All right. Simulation timer. So, uh, name, timer callback, name, function. Okay, so we're going to whack that out. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's a mod I'd like to see. Okay. Um, oops, no, we're not. I'm going to say timer. Oops. Hmm, no, that's not right. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So my timer done callback. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I think SETI's uh, theory is about cooling might be a thing. I've had this laptop. It's a framework laptop, which I wholeheartedly recommend. Um, but it might be having cooling issues after about two years of, like, you know, getting it quite hot to, to play games on it. Uh, I don't play a lot of games on here, but uh, I do develop Morrowind on it. I do stream, obviously, on it. Um, I don't know. Maybe, like, the thermal cooling on it has gone bad or something. It's time to pop it open, I think. Maybe even hit up the framework forums and see if other people have similar issues. Um, alrighty then. Um, so simulation timer. We'll put my callback here. Delay is going to be, uh, let's do, you know, just one second for now. Timer down callback. Args, we don't need any. Surely that's not actually a, a I feel like my um language server here is complaining about things it ought not to be. Come here you. There we go. Those red squigglies. Ooh. Okay. 
so timer done uh true uh, simulation timer we're gonna set this guy run repeatedly wow yeah we're just inviting so many more race conditions here and you wouldn't want to normally do this but let's just do this for fun let's say timer done false that way we at least uh I have to understand my code as I'm reading it. Wow. This is a this is a bit of a mess. Okay, so what's happening here when we're not ready? This code will never run. Now it will. Yeah, well yeah, exactly. Uh and I'm not, you know, I'm not too concerned with having perfect code right now. We're just play, poking around, playing around with things. I honestly don't think I will actually add this code into distant fixes because again, the um you know, the scenario that we're hitting here where the code is crashing would never happen in a normal playthrough, right? Like, I could disable triggering that quest and then trigger it from the console and, shoo, crisis averted. Um, but this is, a, you know, an interesting look at some OpenMW Lua hacking, um, if it's, even if it's a little pointless. So, okay. So if it's not timer done, we're going to run the timer and we're going to set it's true. Uh... Oh no, is maybe uh, we're still kind of having a really nasty loop here. I think this is going to be a futile. I'm just going to fire it up again real soon, but I'm utterly failing at doing this the right way. Oh my, yeah, computer really unhappy right now. Bless you. Hey, we, we, we at least got in-game. Um, that's good. I didn't cause an infinite loop this time. Great job. Let's uh, let's scroll up in the log here. Did we still blow up? <laughs> we sure did. Okay, so my code didn't actually do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> let's pop back in here. So, not ready. This is not ever running. Let's go ahead and just put this in here. Print. Hey, okay, so it's happening, kind of. <laughs> but it's only happening once. Let's go back to our code. I'm going to go ahead and put up another print here. Find bin stop. All right. I have ran. All right. Good. So we're not actually stopping it, but I'm not clear on... You know, we should be seeing I have ran every second popping up in here. I'm a shameless puts debugger. And by that I mean I will print till the cows come home to sanity check my code. We don't really have a better debugging method anyway for OpenMW Lua, so that's how it'd be. Here we go. Interesting. I'm not really sure why adding this print in here should have changed anything, but uh, here we are. <laughs> so it's, uh, I have ran every second, like we intend. Um, it's interesting because we are still, come on now. We are still getting this crash. This code, line 55. Is this a, a skill issue and I didn't save? Rut row. Line 55 is not the right line here. 
Oh, wait. Yeah, okay, it's crashing because field seconds, a nil value, really? Interesting. Let's go back to the documentation here. The friendly documentation. Oh, right, of course, time second. Maybe that's why I never had the rate, uh, the infinite loop. Here we go. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is no good. Okay, infinite loop time. Kill it. All right. Ooh. All right, let's back out of here a little bit and bring ourselves back to Sandy Zone. <laughs> Comment this out. Remove this code. And let's just confirm that I at least somewhat know what I'm talking about here. We'll go in game. And we're not going to immediately trigger the quest. And we'll look at the log output. Yeah, okay. The mod happily loads. And uh, we can see here... Uh, <laughs> we can see here different uh, objects being registered with the script. So everything's everything's happening happening happily. Um, you're marking things as registered. Good, good. And no problems then. Whoa, except for my CPU just saying no, no. Yikes. Wowza. Okay, let's X out of here. So, hmm. Thank you for going on that journey with me. We're going to go ahead and abandon this pursuit though. Um, and I'm going to have to think a little bit... <laughs> I was having breakfast and thinking, this should be easy, right? But um, as Joe Toho and others have pointed out, this approach is not good. This approach is not right. It's really easy to get in, like, recursive, you know, loops and infinite loops and, and prevent the game to run. So uh, prevent the game from running. So I'm going to sleep on this for now. And I actually want to go over to my other mod, which actually has a more reasonably fixable problem. Um, I'm going to revisit that at another time. So the problem that we're facing here is, again, when you are in the on update loop, it's running every frame, but things are happening independent of that. Like maybe, uh, so my code is every frame trying to look at what the player has equipped. <coughs> Excuse me. And notice if it's, not something that the mod spawned in, so not a bound weapon, then it will say, oh, okay, you've got uh, these gauntlets equipped. If it happens to be a bound weapon, then we know we'll try to re-equip that. But it's happening every second, and I would say like one in ten times it would not properly register because of a, a race condition situation. So let's... There we go. Um... And as you can see, I've already tried to noodle on this a little bit here. Um, but basically, my approach was completely do away with every frame looking at what's equipped because that's flaky. And the approach instead will be uh, when we put bound gear on the player, we'll say, okay, this is what the player had. Put it in a table. Nothing is running every frame. And then when we despawn, so we have this function here called expired. Ooh, it's actually right here. Hey, now. We have this bit of code here called expired, which, uh, yeah, exactly. Krabby Mud Crab, you nailed it. That's exactly the approach I'm trying to go for. Uh, so when the thing expired, so that means this code runs, um, we have a, t when we spawn the weapon, we set a timer and when the timer expires, we run this function called expired. And so my intention is then at the very bottom here, you can see, yeah, yeah, you can see I'm saying, try to re-equip. And, uh, what I've done is I've just deleted a bunch of code relating to, um, the old way of doing it, and I have, uh, ooh, looks like I left off just actually trying to make this work. Trying to re-equip. So, 
in a nutshell um what we'll do here is we'll just say rather than like this shenanigans here where i'm like oh yeah uh you know um go through this uh equipped gear and and you know hope for the best because one of the one of the situations we would run into is we would have multiple uh requests to try to re-equip happen at the same time and so maybe one thing was for gauntlets the other thing was for an axe and they didn't know about each other really and batching them didn't really work out too well what i tried to do was like say okay first before we try to re-equip let's like get a list of everything but like i i could i could cast two different bound spells like in quick succession or use like hotkey uh, a scroll you know um, and they would they would stomp on each other. So the approach, uh, as you mentioned, of of noticing things that were equipped when we spawn the bound item, um, and then when they expire, trying to reequip them is a little bit. It's more, it's a better approach, and it's a best effort attempt too, right? It could still fail. So what we're gonna do here is uh, we'll say, <clears throat> excuse me, we're still gonna do something like this. We're gonna look at what the player has equipped. Because the way equipping equipment works in OpenMW Lua is you don't necessarily just like equip one thing. You you take the equipment as a table, you put the thing that you want to add or remove, so remove it, on the table, and then you reapply all the equipment at once. And, and therein kind of lies why my previous bad approach was hitting was having issues. So um, I don't need to do reequip, you know, uh, signal there. We're just gonna say okay. Let's see here. So I have this, uh, I forget what me two or three months ago did. <sighs> Save, please. Yes. Okay, so I have this replaced gear. Okay, good. Let's see now. Replaced gear. Okay. Oh, I'm not actually uh, registering that. So let's... um. We're going to actually have to put that in there. So when you summon a bound item. Ah, yeah, okay. Ooh, this code too. This was a deep cut in this mod. Holy moly. All right. So when you cast the spell, basically what happens is we call into this global script. In OpenMW Lua, your Lua mods are context aware, meaning you have scripts attached to objects like the player or NPCs or a door. And then you have a, a global script, which is a basically attached to the whole world. And when you want to spawn in new items, that's something that's done in a global context. And if you're asking, well, why do it in this way? Um, it's a, certainly a design decision, but the overarching motivation for it is that OpenMW hopes someday to add a multiplayer. And in a multiplayer design, you have to be aware of like local context, like stuff that's happening on your computer with the player, and then things that happen, you know, on the world or the server. Um, and so, something that happens on the server can be, a, you know, can affect or be viewed by multiple people. And so, we need that to be coordinated, right? If we were in a server, the global script would do its thing and then send a packet to all the players and they would see the new thing. But if I like have something local to my player, uh, not necessarily everybody needs to know about that. Not every client needs to hear about that. So um, here we go. Okay, so reviewing code I wrote several months ago. We have changed this. Yeah, okay. We are batching. So what I had previously done was set a timer Yes, it's coming back to me now. I had set a timer individually for each item, and now we're trying to batch them. So if you have, like, uh, the Scroll of Mahas Vengeance, I believe is the name of it, which gives you, like, a, almost a full suit of bound gear, we're going to look at all the new things we spawned, loop through them, put them in a table, and then set the timer here with a table of things to despawn. And when it's time to despawn, we're going to loop through them all. We're going to disable them. Uh, I have this little helper here to despawn them, which will basically remove them uh, in the back end again. Um, and then we're going to send this event to the player. And retry slots looks to be a table of slots. So good, looking good there. So first things first, when we run expired, MOMWBB expired calls this one. 
Okay, yes, this is old code. Okay, so we actually have slots, plural here. And let's go back up to try to re-equip. Okay, so um, slots. And so we're going to have for nothing slot in pairs slots. Ooh. We're going to say if replace gear, which we have not populated yet, slot. Come on now. There we go. So if we actually have something first, um, this check may or may not actually be necessary. I'll smooth that out later, but for now, just to be safe, we're going to check that there is something in that table to re-equip. We're going to say equip. Slog. No, slot. There we go. back the highlighting there we go redefine local alias okay there we go we'll just give it a unique name I'm using slots somewhere else okay um, so we're getting the equipment we're taking note of what's there we are sent we're looping through uh, the equipment slots that we have sent from the expire function we're checking that we have some gear for we're looping through each slot again we're checking that we have some gear to be re-equipped and then we're saying equipped in that slot which under the hood slots are our numbers give me that and so in our replaced gear table it's going to look like the key is going to be the slot so a number and the value is going to be the um reference id of the thing to be re-equipped that uh, was replaced by a bound item. And, uh, excuse me, we don't, excuse me. We don't need to have any, oh, we don't need to have any Boolean to tell us if we need to re-equip, we're just gonna, we're just gonna do it. And so all this code just becomes that. Uh, get the equipment, look at slots that need to be replaced. If we got something to replace them, replace them, boom, re-equip it. Just gonna be that easy, I hope. This code looks relatively untested, but uh, yeah, okay. So coming back down to here though, we still haven't uh, replaced slot. Hmm? E replaced gear. Oh, look at that, hey. That's the code I just wrote. So we're not actually filling replace gear up at all. Let's decide where to do that. Okay. Let's pull the whoop. let's pull the global script back up. So coming back to here, this code runs when the player summons a bound item. Uh, again, when we spawn an item, we have to. Uh, we have to do it on a global script. Can't do it in the player script, so. Uh, ooh, yeah, interesting question. So this table is meant to be just for, it. so the slots in Morrowind are hard-coded for each kind of, you know, for, for greaves, for boots, for armor, for left hand, for right hand, so like, this equipped gear slot is is encompassing anything that can be equipped so it's just going to be a grab bag of all the things i hope that um i hope that answers your question and actually i need to adjust my desk it's time to sit down time
I, I think I see where you're going for here. Like we want to simplify the code, right? Rather than maybe having a grab bag. That's a, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, okay, so when we uh, equip the item, we are starting the timer and then we are, so you don't, you could equip from the global script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the intention to ho, to ho, yeah. Equipped gear is a map, it's basically a map, right? And again, the key would be the slot the thing is equipped and the value would be the, the record ID. Um, and uh, actually when we get going a little further here, I'll print that out so we can actually visualize it. Um, we could technically equip the stuff on the player in the global script, I think that is possible. For now, I'm gonna continue with my um, doing it in the player script though. And so we send the event to the player. We got this uh, equip items function right here. Okay, and so this seems like a reasonable place to uh, notice the stuff that was replaced. Okay, so what are we doing here? Okay items for player what is for player it's a table okay okay yeah so for player is another table probably not the best name we'll revisit that it's another table where the slot is the key and the value is a nested table where we pass along some information we have the effect id i don't exactly recall why we need that so we're going to leave that there for now and the item which is the new item uh, that we spawned in here. Okay, so we don't know anything about the thing we're replacing basically until we get here. Okay, so far so good. So now we're looping through this table that we have sent down the wire and we're saying, if it's Equipped gear. What am I doing here with this? Oh me, oh my. Equipped gear. This might be more code I can just delete, honestly, but. Oh, I see, okay, no, no, no. So, hmm, I actually might be able to just delete this. Doesn't look like it's actually used anywhere outside of here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna comment this all out. I don't think we need it. I'm gonna operate on that assumption. Let's come back up here and make it official. Equipped, yep, comment it out. And so uh, we're doing the same kind of pattern that we did above, right? We're taking a look at the equipment the player has. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So looping through the stuff that we need to equip before we equip it, which again, we're doing here, we're overwriting the slot with the item that we sent down the wire. But before we do that, what we're gonna uh, take a look at is if equipment, come on now, if equipment, slot no there we go it's not nil so if we have something in the slot we're attempting to work with we're gonna say uh, replaced gear yeah okay getting back into the headspace of my brain from a couple of months ago let's say slot this one all right so if there's something in the slot before we replace it take note of it save it in replace gear table uh, equip it I don't exactly remember active effects the significant uh, uh, the significance of it let's take a quick look active effect Ah, right, okay, okay, it's coming back to me now. So part of the whole shtick with uh, bound items is it's not just the item, but there's actually a spell effect that gets applied on the player when you cast the spell, you know, bound axe or whatever. And so when we expire uh, the item, we can't just 
we can't just like nuke the item. We actually have to remove the spell effect too. Like let's say for example, the timer doesn't expire, but I drop the weapon. Cause right now I cannot prevent the player from dropping the weapon the way vanilla bound items do. So if you are playing just vanilla Morrowind and you try to drop a bound item, it, it won't let you do it. I believe it like pops up some message or you just can't do it. Yeah. You just can't do it. With my mod, you can because it's not like really a bound item. So I have to have some code, which exists down here. Using the uh, UI mode changed event, I basically look at uh, when we're in an interface that allows the player to muck with inventory. I check to make sure, okay, these are the things that we have equipped active effects. Did Is it no longer in the inventory? If we dropped it, then we'll call the expired function to despawn it. And so we also have to, if because the timer didn't just expire. When the timer expires, the engine removes the spell effect. But when we expire it because they dropped it, we also have to nuke the spell effect. So that's what we're doing there. Okay, so that's what this code is for. Ooh. All right. Um, handle multiple things. I think I've done that, but I'm going to just go ahead and leave that <laughs> comment there. Uh, delete this. Goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye. Okay, so let's let's uh, review what we got here. If there's something equipped, put it in the replace gear table. Why? Because we have up here try to re-equip. Because up here we're saying oh, going all over the place here. Mm, okay. Um, actually, we don't want this re-equip. Re -equip. What is this? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. So this variable, we're all over the place. This variable re-equipped reads a player setting. The mod allows you to disable the re-equip thing. Um, and so what happens here is when the script loads, we read the value of if it's if that feature is enabled or not. Then we create a function that will update that value if you enable it or disable it. And we uh, put a async sub callback subscription onto that value. That's what this chunk of code does basically. If you enable it or disable it, we take note of it and we have this reequip, which probably should have a better name, reequip setting, so I remember what it is and don't have to scroll up for it. Um, so yeah, coming back down here, if the player has reequip enabled, we will try to reequip. And we give it a table of slots. And yeah, let's just double check what that table is because I'm like kind of doubting myself here. For a player. Oh, okay, okay, I see now. Mm -hmm. So expired. Yeah, expired sends down the wire a table of just slots. We're insert, you're using table insert. By using table insert, instead of a syntax like this, right here, when you use when you use table insert, your key is always a numerical value starting at one up to however many things you have. When I do this, the key is like whatever I put in these brackets. Um, for simplicity's sake, I passed me, chose to just send it down the wire as a as a automatically keyed table good job um so going back to my try to re-equip code which i feel like i should move down to be by the other ones there you go so we have a table of slot uh of slots we don't really need the key value there so i just discard it by making an underscore you could totally just say like I or whatever, but then if you're like me and you're using a language server aware editor, it puts a little thingy there saying you didn't use it right. In lieu of the proper way to not use something is you put it as an underscore um, in, in this context. So we're going through each slot. If we have, so like technically speaking, if my code is correct, this should not be needed because we would never, um, we would never store a slot that we didn't also assign to, uh, uh, well, no, that's not true actually, because if we just didn't have something we replaced, yeah. So I'm gonna leave that there, but if we have actually something to replace, because if we didn't check for this, we would do this and it would be nil. 
and then we would try to equip something nil, which would probably make the engine unhappy. Uh, all right. Well, geez, I mean, it seems too simple, but really, so we'll go through each of the slots. We will adjust the equipped table as necessary and then reset the equipment on self, which is the player here. Yeah. Okay. I think maybe we can give this a try. I don't know. I like am somewhat optimistic about this not being a complete dumpster fire. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if like when we when we get here and we send this data to the player here in this uh, event call and we come down here to equip items, if we didn't have a pauldron on our left shoulder, there's going to be nothing to replace later, you know. So uh, that's what this check is for, right? If it, if there's something there, say later, you know, save it for later. So, all right. At this point, I don't know if the code's perfect or not, but I think it's a, it's a sensible enough time to just try and run it. So let's make sure I got this mod actually enabled. Whoa, whoa. So, um, balance, okay. Indeed, I did not have it enabled. There we go. Cool, okay. Another thing I really wanted to do, by the way, for this one is Pope Rigby many months ago requested, uh, let's see if I have that work in progress. Uh, yeah, yeah, Train Whiz has a bound weapon replacer mod. Makes the items look more Skyrim-y, and I wanted to add support for that. Um, might be something we can do here before we shift over to the next thing, which I do want to get to some website hacking before we're all said and done here. All right, uh, well, hold on to your butts. So my intention now is we're going to summon... <laughs> yeah, right? Ugh. I know it's probably a bad advertisement for the framework laptop, but honestly, it's a stellar machine. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna TCL on this. And so you can see my test characters fully decked out. We're gonna go ahead and let's do a bound helmet. Where you are, there we go. We're gonna summon that. And then let's just pause the game real quick. And we can see here, I've got some logging that kind of is walking us through what the mods did. So we, <sighs> yeah, I mean, sure. I <laughs> uh, appreciate that. Um, I am kind of pushing it, yeah. Although, as I said before, I'm a little disappointed. And maybe it's because of thermal throttling. I am a little disappointed that we're not like, the CPU frequency is at 2.7 gigahertz. I mean, come on, man. What the hell? Let's just put it in uh, performance mode again. And I feel like, yeah, it shouldn't be hovering at around like two gigahertz. We should be like upper threes, you know? So could be that I've like misconfigured the governor. Actually, like before I ever tried to muck with the governor, I never had these problems on the stream. I did like a year worth of streaming and didn't have that. Um, all right, Seti, we will talk. Uh, so anyways, though, we got little log entries here that kind of walk us through what's happening, okay? In the, so I mentioned before that kind of using on update is not really a best practice. Well, actually here I do use, um, I don't use on update, but I use the run repeatedly function mentioned by our friend Detail Devil, and I run it at a very, very short interval. Actually, I run it every one-tenth of a second. Um, and uh, so it's not quite, on update levels, but it's very frequently. Uh, oh no, maybe I'm doing it. No con update interval. Yeah, okay. Let's let's just for posterity look at the common update interval right here. Yeah, one tenth of a second. So not quite every single frame, but like really frequently. And why do I do that? Because uh, read spells. I have to basically inter when the player casts a bound weapon. We don't have uh, like a, a handler or an event that I can use to notice that the player has cast a bound weapon at the right time. We have the um, the skill uh, 
handler, which basically lets me intercept skill usages. But unfortunately, the conjure skill, conjuration skill usage triggers before the actual weapon gets. It's like I cast the spell, conjure triggers, then like a half second or so later, I get the item and it's too late. So I have to have this that runs every tenth of a second, and it it loops through the player's active spells, and it then each active spell has spell effects. I know it's a little confusing. So you have an active spell, and a spell might have uh, one or does certainly have one or perhaps m more than one effects. And so we loop through the effects, and we say, okay, right here, if this is an effect that we care about, start doing the magic. Um, and yeah, so there's several effects that we care about. For bound gloves, we have to have special handling because that's the one that uh, that has two items. Um, that's an interesting idea, Detail Devil. Um, you mean check the spell status? That's a really interesting idea. We could check it in the global script and then send an event back to the player. Interesting idea. Certainly worth uh, playing around with before I actually ship this update. But uh, anyway, so in my in my not quite on update but almost function here, we're, we're basically trying to notice the spells that are run, and if it's a spell and a spell effect that we care about, process the uh, the information about it, build up information about what we're what we're replacing, what the item is. Um, as I mentioned before, the mod scales the item that you're gonna get with your um, you know your conjuration uh, skill, and so that's a get replacement level basically is a uh, this guy up here that uh looks a little nasty but this is how we decide which one to load because right now i can't actually just on the fly add the record so i have a uh basically a dot esp plugin that adds the different levels one through five that i've made ahead of time in the construction uh set um and then yeah when we find something we then you know send a global event and we do the handling so back to the code at hand here oh my here we go so now we've got what do we got let's go to my inventory and you can see we've got the uh ruined bound helmet which uh if you're very familiar with the uh, bound items you'll note here uh we've got a weight on that thing that uh is not quite what you might be used to we got an armor rating that is uh it's not really you know not really what the normal bound helm is so let's go ahead and just try to uh Drop that on the ground. Despawns. Okay. Now. Oof. Okay. <laughs> My code blew up. That's fine, though. Um, some of the code still worked because we properly despawned it, but what didn't work here is try to re-equip. So let's go to line 329. I'm going to cancel out of the game to ease on the potato. My extremely hot potato right now. Line 100, 329. And the error specifically was, come on now. Bad argument. Table expected got nil. Okay. Um, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I wonder I wonder performance and accuracy-wise how that would work compared to my, uh, yeah, how that would work compared to my current approach. Thank you, Detail Devil, for the snippet. I'm going to try that. I'm going to put this right here in a comment. Cool. Thank you for that. Noted for later. Um, so, okay. Actually, what I've done is I've ruined the accuracy of the error message. So let's shuffle that down a little bit more. Um, so saying 329, bad argument number one to pairs. Come on now. Equipment slots. Okay. So my table is nothing. That's interesting. Let's go down to expired here. Here to where we're calling expired okay <clears throat> excuse me oh excuse me okay thing slot 
to despawn. So we're sending this data to despawn. To despawn. Okay, let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so this is a bit of sanity checking code just to make sure that uh, th that it does what I think it's doing, what I expect it to do, which is give me a slot, you know, um, insert into the despawn table, a table for each thing that I want to despawn. Um, and then actually, as I'm saying that out loud here, for a blank thing, okay, data to despawn thing slot, yeah, that should be right. Okay. Yeah, that's very true. You could do most with MW script for sure. I try not to intermix it too much uh, cuz I'm not sure how much the MW script API would change over time. Um, but it's good to keep in mind. Maybe it's a cleaner approach. Cuz really at the end of the day, we want the code to be as simple and not confusing as possible, right? Uh the code should not be clever. Um and I have gotten a little on the clever side here. For sure which is why we're even in this boat to begin with. So, okay. All right, let's go ahead and summon in a helmet again. And so what I'm expecting to see here is a, uh, uh, not quite yet, no. Um, hang on, I can, get you a, I can get you a solid answer on that. Okay, given slot zero, let's just do this again. Long sword, just to prove that that changes given slot 16. So here I summoned a helmet, slot zero, slot 16, okay? So far so good, let's go back to the code. Given slot, so this is what I have passed along, I did a slot. Retry slots, thing slot. And, and we're again, we're batching things here because we're going to send, instead of sending multiple expiration calls, we're going to send one that's batched and will hopefully prevent race condition like situations here. Uh, okay. I'm going to go ahead and take this code and move it on up here. Oh, 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 okay. Ooh, I see the problem now that I'm talking about it here. So when I drop the helmet on the ground, actually this code never gets called. Instead, as I mentioned before, we're calling the code down here for the UI update. This is where the, whoops, this is where the magic happened as I noted here, detect item drops. Aha, so we basically don't ever have that information. Okay, okay. Um, let's back out of the game real quick, and I'm going to give you some statistics about the mod code here. And so let's go one fetch. Uh, so let's see, lines of code, 594. Let's do a bit of a better readout here. So we have 646 lines of Lua, according to the other tool. 557 lines of code, strictly. 49 comments and 40 blank lines. So yeah, not really that much per se, but uh, yes, it absolutely should. Um, let's see here, rest training. If not, that's a good, uh, yeah, one fetch. That's right, steadiness. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, one fetch. It's a neat little command line thingy that will give you a cool logo for your for your coding language. Uh, so if I go here to Momo Configurator and I run one fetch, we got the Go Gopher, uh, for example. E yeah, so um, that's what I'm trying to do while be so taking a step back. It might sound a little sensible, but like to have like a different check for each specific slot. Um, it gets a little gnarly and it should totally be possible to have the check be agnostic to the particular thing and it just takes the parameter of the slot you want to check because really all slots are handled the same way there's no difference between handling boots or gloves you know um 
So I think I get where you're trying to go with that. But we're trying to, we're trying to have unspecial simple code. Um, Detail Devil. I need to actually check this. I'm going to go ahead and copy another quote from you because I don't think I ever actually tried that. But um, it should be a simple matter of checking the UI for the uh, – no, no, no. That's a great question, Krabby Mud Crab, for sure. It's a totally reasonable thing to ask. Um, but, yeah, this code here should also – if it doesn't, I don't remember if I even tried that. Um, I want to say I did, but we'll, we'll – look at it in a second but if this doesn't handle selling the thing uh then it's we certainly could by simply saying um checking for the whatever the the ui mode is for going to you know a merchant all right um so let's see here i think what we need to do active effects what we'll probably need to do and this might this might completely obsolete the need for passing along the slots here but we might have to in if not we might we are going to have to store the slot in the active effects table because we aren't going to get the, the timer callback from expired here because we are in advance expiring the thing so yeah and what will happen then when we delete the item here when this runs it's going to hit this um if the item is valid check and uh, this probably isn't good enough, actually. I'll probably have to, like, bail out of this function completely with, like, a, I don't know, something. Um, but we don't we don't want to run this code. We don't want to send this event if the item is not valid. And the item would not be valid if we've already deleted it, for example, here in the, uh, in the UI mode changed event. So let's go ahead and close the global script for a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, equip items. So I think what we need to do here ID data item. I think what we're going to need to do here, and this is going to have some knock-on effects, um, is we're going to need to just ignore this code for a sec. Right here, when we pack this information um, for active effects, or active spells, rather. Yikes, I'm getting mixed up here. Active effects, active spells. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's expired. Whoops. Okay. Equipped. Okay. Active effects. I'm having trouble remembering what kind of data we're stuffing in here to begin with. Um, Oh, uh, okay. So active effects is a table that contains lots of other things. Okay. Okay. Uh, Smalia. Okay. So that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, uh, kind of. So it's an interesting question. So what we're dealing with here is items that go away forever. When they get expired, because these are magical items. They're not real. They're ethereal. So we wouldn't need to worry about that in this case, thankfully because that would make things pretty complicated. Okay, so that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing. Um it's kind of what we're doing. When we call this expired function, we are forcing the hand. However, I could instead of doing that, I could go back to the global script. I could say like maybe do some global event that will immediately run like this code. I could put this code into a function and immediately run it, but I'd like, that's a little more back and forth than I think I need to do right now. Um, but that's a really interesting idea. And, and it kind of illustrates that there are many ways to kind of approach this. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting thought. Let's go back to here though. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so what I want to know is, am I putting the slot into active effect? And I don't active effects. And I don't think I actually am. Um, so items is a table. Give me that bold. Come on. 
Yeah, totally. Exactly. Uh, it's actually quite a lot of fun to to do this kind of rubber duck pair programming exercise with you on the stream. It's one of the reasons why I love doing this. All right. Um, and also, yeah, it's uh, if you've never wrote code before or if you're not too familiar with the whole creative process of it, wow, it's pretty hard to look at code you wrote yourself even like a month ago because I'm just like, whoa, especially any sufficiently complicated mod, which this isn't a whole lot of code, but ooh, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, definitely detail devil. It's certainly common practice to do that too. Um, a lot of my mods intermix them. Um, and, and again, maybe like some of these things are better handled with MMW script. I have to really rethink that. All right, so items, active effects. Where are my active effects? Items, okay, okay. Interesting, okay. So I think what I should do is actually right here, not up here. So what I had perhaps mistakenly decided was um, handle replaced gear right here. Yeah, settiness. Yeah, thank you for that call out. And it's totally true. Like I, So to give you a little background, I decided that this mod needed to exist when I was playing. And I'm like, ugh. I don't want to not use bound items. You know, it's a great excuse to, to level up conjuration, but like, wow, it's so cheesy to get a bound long sword early in the game. And I started implementing this and yeah, it's, there's way more you have to consider than you might think. Now, if we had a, like an event handler or something that I could hook into that's closer to when like the item spawns, it might simplify a lot of this, but even still, a lot of this is just necessary. There's a lot of things to keep track of, but I think my earlier assumption that we're handling replace gear right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's just replacing bound items, right? It's not like go home or like a vampire overhaul mod that's doing a lot of things. Um, this is like conceptually simple, but deceptively complex. So I think my earlier assumption that I need to manage the replace gear table here was wrong. We need to way earlier, um, way earlier, like before we even tell the global script to spawn stuff, we need to record that here. So let's see here. Um, we have two branches. As you can see, I have a to-do note here, make them all a table. That way we wouldn't have a if else. We would just treat everything like it's a table. Um, I've just been too lazy to take that approach, but maybe I should. Uh, let's see here. So replaced gear. Um, oh, okay, 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 yep. Slots left gauntlet. And we'll make the value. Uh, let's see here. What's the old thing? I'm not sure if this is just the record, if this is the actual object or the record ID. I'm just going to say old left. Whoa, whoa. All right. Ooh. No, 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 no. Okay. Ooh, this is a I'm realizing a partic I'm realizing a problem here. Okay. This old left is gonna be like the vanilla bound item we don't want that <laughs> so this code is actually incorrect and I actually need to take a step back and think about my whole approach here I think maybe not uh, as frequently as every one tenth of a second but I am gonna need to look at what the player has equipped um and when would it be a good time to do that? 
And I'm going to actually wrap up this endeavor here, but not before we kind of talk about a better approach to this. Because, yeah, I was completely mistaken in assuming that I could do it then because I don't have... By the time that code runs, the vanilla bound item has already replaced the thing that I hopefully want to re-equip later on, you know. So really, we need to notice the equipment beforehand. But I don't want to do it super frequently because that's how we end up in race condition land. So let's see here. We might... Uh, we might try to notice when the player first logs in. We might, when the player loads the game. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly, Joe Toho. That's an excellent point. Um, types really, really would make this thing a lot easier to, to grok. One thing I... Uh, one thing I have kind of in my mountain of projects that I want to do is to create a language server protocol definitions for OpenMW Lua. And that would go a long way in helping, but it wouldn't be as good as real types. Um, okay, Detail Devil. That's interesting. Um, and that's what I had first thought, but I think at that point it's too late, right? Once we notice the effect is active, it's too late because the vanilla weapon has already replaced that thing. Um but let's go back down here to my list. And, and uh, so when the player first starts a game, we can notice what they have equipped. When the player closes the inventory UI, might also be a pretty good time to notice what they have equipped, right? Because when the inventory UI is open for sales, uh, Potentially, because, right, you could sell something you have equipped. Um, that's a good time to register it as well. Again, we're trying to avoid checking it, like, a lot, you know, really hyper-checking it. Um, when the spell effect is readied, ooh, okay, okay, that's a... Um, and we can do that by checking, like, when the stance changes. When the player changes to the spell stance. Yeah, that's a good call. Okay, so when the player first starts the game, load up what they have equipped. When they close the inventory or sales UI, load up what they have equipped. When the player changes to the spell stance, load what they have equipped. Yeah, I think that should cover a pretty wide array of scenarios. It might... Thinking if somebody is, for example, using Erm's uh, Swift Casting mod, where you like press the the ready button and it casts it all in one move. I think it should handle that as well, as long as we're properly detecting the change to the spell stance. So I think this would actually put us in a good place to properly know ahead of time. Detail devil again with his uh, <laughs> MW script approach. I prefer to keep it. So the reason I prefer to keep it Lua is because all this stuff, these things here can be done in a Lua player script. Doing that will require bouncing back to the global script. And every time I do that, I, ha I have a, a delay. I think there's a one frame delay mandatory going from a player script to the global script and back to the player script. So it might be a little laggy, but it's that's worthy to keep on the docket as a potential approach. Okay. Uh, so we got a question here from Joto again. I have a kind of life cycle... E okay um so yes jotoho that would be ideal um and i did mention earlier we have kind of a callback like that let's go look at it in the docs um because yes you're absolutely right pulling suboptimal so we have this the skill progression interface um ooh. okay You just gave me an idea. I'm going to keep saying what I was going to say. This is not sufficient to trigger the whole sequence of spawn in the bound item and request it because this registers before uh, the actual spell effect is active and I have the weapon. So I don't like know for sure, right? I can't just look at the spell because the player could make a custom spell or I could be using... Um, a scroll or something that has more than one. So while I can't use this to determine when to trigger the sequence of spawning and equipping a, a new item, I could use this as a way. So let's add this here to our list of possible scenarios. Um, 
when we could say add skill used handler when the conjuration skill is used could be another context where i can say um notice what the player has equipped um and yeah uh settiness i think when you said context switching do you mean like going from a weapon to a spell ready context or uh no 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 no, no, no. Sp skill progression is not handling spells it is triggered when a skill increase happens including but not limited to spells so for example when i cast the conjuration spell this skill used handler runs um but as i said it's a little too late to actually have the spell effect information right for that as you noted we would want to have like a particular event or handler for the spell itself but that is not yet implemented into OpenMW. we don't have the ideal happy path that's why even i'm going down this kind of gnarly you know thought process here um so i'm gonna go ahead and add this oh, oh no okay yeah yeah sure it is so it is a bit like that right like we have uh it is literally that actually we're switching from the player context to the world context and then back and there's just this delay um there is some stuff that happens instantly but i'm not going to go down that route here so um when the player uses the conjuration skill it's a little overkill because we still don't know it's exactly a conjuration spell that we care about we could maybe in here uh might be worth trying to whoa my cpu is saying no right now my sincere apologies about that um we could may it's maybe worth looking at to, and it's been a while i don't remember exactly how much information about what relating to conjuration we've done um but one caveat here is this so in here in this approach we would need to check for conjuration skill getting used maybe the enchant skill getting used like if we have an enchanted thing that summons a bound item but like i don't really know what would cover a scroll you could have a scroll and indeed there is scroll of mahaz vengeance for example that would add a bound item and skill progression handler you know wouldn't give you jack there it would it would just be useless so um it wouldn't cover every scenario um changing spell stance would cover using a scroll perhaps um and it would also cover using an enchanted item um i still think this is a worthy tree to bark up um so what are we talking about i had already tried to say okay after we've equipped the um the item we're gonna say okay or before rather we're gonna say what is the thing we're replacing but that's too late yeah so uh detail devil what i don't like about that code and and in mw script in general is you result in overly terse code that has to have a branch for every single possible uh you know um thing you could equip and i prefer lua offers the ability to have code that is sort of generic right i'm only caring about a slot or something that's not a bad approach though um okay so when i can notice what the player has equipped i think these are some decent um these are some decent contexts when the player first starts the game when they close the inventory or sales ui when they change to the spell stance maybe when they use the conjuration or possibly enchant skill and then we can send from a global script uh using a rube goldberg machine of mw script global script player script when this when the spell is ready that might be better than changing checking the spell stance on a timer here in the player script um that would be a little bit more event based kind of um then so then we could maybe get an accurate picture of what the player had equipped beforehand whoo <laughs> this is a lot crazier than i expected it to be okay i'm gonna go back to my little planning document here um wow so yeah this was a complete dumpster fire looking at the race condition here i still would like to handle this but wow that like really escalated quickly in complexity um i don't i'm not sure what i'm gonna do for this but this i at least feel like we have a decent idea of what we might be able to do you know to fix this um and you know maybe i'll uh, have some lunch and bang it out later today but uh two other things i wanted to do 
uh, before the end of the stream, which is drawing upon us very quickly, is um, take a look at WIP lists. And I, we are going to look at this, but I might actually bang this out more quickly because this will give us a chance to touch on something Jotoho mentioned a moment ago, which is uh, Lua not having a static type system. And I wrote the Momo configurator with a Go language, um, which is statically typed. And it has the beauty of that information to help prevent errors and help you understand what the code actually does. So let's actually go there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where is it? Okay. The go. All right. Cool. And uh, so what I mean by static types is I can like, I can hover over a function here. And at the bottom, you can see it says, excuse me this string in blue, that means that this function returns something that is a string, right? Right here, I'm creating a variable and it's a type of a buffer from the bytes package. And this allows for a lot more uh, safe code, you know, while, while it can be convenient with Lua and other duct type languages to not carry about, care about types and just kind of, you know, freewheel it, it can be really annoying when you're juggling through things like when we were looking at bound balance a minute ago, and I had to keep going like, wait, what's in here? You know, if we had types, I could just like do something like this and be like, oh yeah, it's a default CFG dir. It's um, it's a string, you know, or or this is a is also a string, you know. And there's no ambiguity whatsoever. So okay, so what am I talking about here? When you do the Momo configurator, and as I mentioned before, if there's a problem, verbose. We say, if there's a problem, we say, uh, yeah, rerun it with verbose for more detailed output. Where that's relevant, right? If the I and I importer blows up, there's going to be some output that is relevant, perhaps, to uh, what blew up. But, like, if we blow up writing a file, the error that we get here is going to be exactly what we want. So we don't need to tell them to run verbose. But, yeah, it's also applicable here for Delta plugin and so on and so forth. So what we can do is to not say that when we don't need to is, um, I don't know, just something like this. If A, and so going back to the value of, uh, of typing, static typing, you can see here in my autocomplete dropdown here, we have this thing A that is the type arg. Um, and so let's just open this up here, args. And uh, in Go and other statically typed languages, you can define your own types here. And so I define, uh, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, R, who, jeez. <laughs> CLI, we have the type arg. A is a, right, jeez, okay. A is the variable. Wow, what am I doing here? Okay. Comment that out for a second. Pull yourself together here, buddy. So A is uh, an instance of the type args. And we can see I set it right here. Args defined here is basically uh, what the commands that the program can take are, right? It's like a kind of a rabbit hole of types all the way up here. We got a different type for each subcommand, okay? So we know now that we the compiler and my editor knows the type, I can just say if a period, and then I have a nice autocomplete complete guide of everything that's in there, right? And there's no like, oh, well, maybe it might be this or maybe it might be that. There's no fuzziness here. It's completely explicit. So a config, mm, a, let's refer back to my types verbose whoops it's a uh, config command okay a config period verbose if verbose um, well, let's actually say if the bang there is a, if it's not verbose remind them to do it Uh, there is no null in Lua. Nil is null. And Golang also uses nil for their null value. That's a great question, Setiness. <laughs> okay, and really, like, that's, it's going to be that easy, right? Like, if we are, so this, to be clear, this is the value of command line stuff that the user passes in. So, like, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I say uh, momo configurator config dash dash help, it would be any of these things. The value of any of these things gets stuffed in this A variable, right? So I'm saying if we have you passed in their verbose flag, don't remind them to use it. There's no need. All right. Let's come back down here. If not a config verbose Very good. And really, like this is actually like kind of a boring, uh, <laughs> kind of a boring fix. But I need an easy win right now after stumbling through some some sticky problems here for the better part of two hours. Verbose. Whoops. Bam. Okay. And then one more time. If bang a config verbose go is not shy about the curly braces, which I do I do appreciate. Lua uh, has the like end delimiter, which I guess is like a then and end, which is like a substitute for curly braces. And then one one more right here. Okay. Ah, yeah, detail devil. I do agree. And I get mixed up. Like, sometimes I'll be writing Go code, and I'll put, like, tilde equals for bang equals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I still love Lua. It's a fantastic little language. If not verbose, remind them to whoops. Hey, now, come on now. Oh, geez. Yeah, Jotoho. Good call. So I'm not familiar with Rust. Um, that's an interesting call out there. But man, JavaScript. Don't even get me started. We've we've gone down the JavaScript hellhole a couple of times in this stream. Hopefully we won't be there any, too much sooner. But uh, shoot, like our friend Sector is working on, you know, the Momo launcher codename Ashyams, which is going to be the graphical mod manager to rule them all for OpenMW, and uh, the front end for Ashams is uh, gonna be is not gonna be it is TypeScript. So while we will be going down the JavaScript rabbit hole, it's gonna be that Chim typed TypeScript. So I'm a little bit less kind of you know shivering in fear. So cool. All right. Um. So what do we got here? Just some really simple checks here, right? If we're not using verbose, verbose, remind the user, hey, maybe you want to use verbose. Um, Java, I believe, is a null language, right? Java, I think, has null for the kind of nil nullish value. I don't write a lot of Java. I only messed with Java years ago when I was trying to do uh, Minecraft mods um, and only, like, very amateurly dabbled in that. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So... When we're reminding the user to use verbose, only do it if they have not already used verbose. Okay, so let's, um, hmm, I wonder how I can create a situation that will break this. Because uh, theoretically, like, this should never happen. It happened earlier for a user on Discord when they got a broken build of ground cover if I, but I'm not going to dig that up. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, well, you know what? I'm just going to leave that as it is for now. And uh, before I commit, let's see here. Service uh, my Momo configurator. Let's run our test suite real quick. Boom. Okay. Awesome. So I have a pretty nice suite of tests for the configurator to give me a reasonably high level of confidence that when I make a change, big or small, it's not going to just break the world. Objective C. Okay. I know absolutely nothing about that. Um, Where's our Mac buddy Zach at? <laughs> he did some Objective C, I think, recently when he was working on a mod manager tool. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, push this on up. All right, so we're gonna don't suggest verbose when they're doing it. push that on up and let's go ahead and uh, I mentioned having a really fantastic 
list of tests, uh, array of tests for this thing. Let's go ahead and watch that happening. Um, one of the things I actually test for the configurator is um, running the configurator. Like with the first time you run it, it prompts you for file paths and, and various things that it needs. And I actually have a test that does that. And I use a Unix utility called expect, which basically simulates user input. It's pretty freaking rad. Um, yeah, you know, um, Jotoho, I totally agree. Um, the platform that Sector has chosen for the Momo launcher, aka Ashyams, is not Electron. It actually utilizes the operating system's web view. So on Windows, I think it's actually Chrome. It'll pull up a Chrome window, Electron. But like on Linux, it's a, uh, and Mac, I believe it's a WebKit, um, web view, but it's actually pretty slim. It's more slim than your average, um, than your average electron based thing. But, uh, and I totally hear you. I was like, I actually kind of complained to sector about this. Um, and the, it's a compromise, right? If we chose to go with cute or something like that, it would make compiling for windows and Mac and Linux a lot more complicated as it is now cross compiling, is like pretty freaking simple, you know? Um, and it also lowers the barrier to entry of, uh, <laughs> fair enough steadiness. It also lowers the barrier to entry for a contributor, right? Like you don't have to know Rust. And I've looked at, I don't know Rust at all, but I looked at the Rust backend and it's definitely easy to grok, but like to have the whole UI in Rust might be a little more tricky. Um, I don't know, it's a compromise, we'll see. Very valid call out, Joe Toho, though, because I feel the same way, right? Like, it's a little, you know, like, sure, it's, it's, you get a lot for free, but they tend to be not very performant and not very thoughtful about your computer resources. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of tech people here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, right, exactly. So, that's one thing that Sector really wanted to drive home is like, hey, somebody who maybe can do like a web UI, right? It's like pretty easy to, very powerfully style things with the the web stack. Um, so, you know, it's still an experimental piece of software, but I think this is the right direction. I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be successful. So we've got this window open in front of us, by the way. And so what do we got here? This is the, every time I push a code change for the configurator, and by the way, all of our repos, all of our mods go through kind of a similar process. We build the software, right? So I'm running tests here, the automated tests, I'm building the executable, and then what you see right here is I'm using the aforementioned expect utility. And expect has a directive called spawn, which will spawn an external executable. And then, yeah, what you're seeing here is we're going through the prompt of setting up the configurator, giving it inputs, and then you don't see it here, but I'm going to go ahead and come on now. So this is the for your edification, this is the expect script. And the syntax basically is like this. You tell it expect, you give it a string to expect, and then when it hits that, it sends the input, right? So we're telling it expect, please enter blah, blah, blah. And when you get that, send the input. Now, this obviously is not what you see here because I have an integration test bash script, which basically does some stuff. We basically create fake executables for all the things. We write them somewhere and then we replace the value in the script with that. And then we, boom, we run it. And then when it's all done, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's powerful and easy to do, but it's possibly suboptimal for every scenario. So we call this expect script to go through the prompts of the configurator. And then when it's all done, I do a couple more checks, right? I look for the OpenMW CFG and I make sure that it has values that I want to see. And then last but not least, I make sure that we got a fully fledged, well, I don't check the content, but I at least make sure the file exists. So each time I make a change to the configurator, I'm like massaging it pretty well, right? Like I've got, uh, for example, here's like my, um, my test suite for the customization, secret customizations feature. What we do here is every time I make a change, I build up some customizations, I apply it to a mod list, I, I give it some data in, I define what it should look like coming out. Um, and if I don't get those values, right, I'd say here, 
for expected and got. This is what I got. This is what I uh, expect, and this is what I'm getting. If there's a problem, then my tests blow up and say, whoa, something's wrong. Um, this is very, very, very nice when you're developing software because you can, like, have a peace of mind. I don't have to, like, sit here and manually try everything on my own, you know. It's, like, automatic, automagic, and uh, it's good for you, the user. So, boom, here we go. Test passed. We're all green. Feels good. All right, let's go back to our checklist. Um, I'm going to check that off. And, well, we actually didn't have any time to do this today, but it's something I really want to do. And, again, you probably already know, but those of us here on the Momo team, we are definitely planning a big update to the website, all the mod lists, not to get the hype train going too preemptively, but once OpenMW049 drops, there's going to be a whole new range of mods, including Bound Balance, including Detail Devil's Devilish Overhaul mod, and many others that are fantastic, but they're dev build only at the moment, and some folks understandably don't want to go there. Not only will those mods be brought into the fold for everybody, but also several other mods that we are you know, playing around with adding are going to be promoted to be in the real list. And so right now, as I mentioned before, we got the 6.10 update, but like... This is going to be a major 7.x change. And so my intention is to allow us to iterate on the, the new 7.x mod lists while keeping the 6.x train going because it might still be a couple of months before OpenMW049 drops, but it's coming. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I thank you for joining me today for the return of the Momo Show. I hope to see you next week. Uh, in between now and then, we're going to hopefully resolve this potato issue that I've got going. Um, we'll hopefully get the audio for those of us in, for those of you in Discord, piping through to the stream. It would have been really big, great to have Gonzo and Seti, anybody else chatting it up with me in here. But now you just get to hear me yakking on. <laughs> um, and yeah, who knows what else will come up in between now and next week. But uh, thank you for joining. Have a lovely day. Happy modding. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>